All right, so Newton's second law. Newton's second law says the net force is mass times acceleration. And you've studied a lot about Newton's second law by now. And so if we think through the whole scientific methods, the first step to observe something interesting. Newton went through and observed this. You know, he observed push on things, they move. How do they move? Came up with his hypothesis that their acceleration was proportional to the forces on them. And then we go through the next step, testing. And so what we're doing today for the experiment is essentially going through and testing a prediction of Newton's second law. So we, as a goal for this experiment, will test to see if Newton's second law predictions are correct for our case. Now remember, we're not going to be able to prove Newton's second law is right, because you can never do that in science. But we're going to test it. Conceivably, you could disprove it. But trust me, this experience, this self-same experiment has been done millions of times, and it's reliable. It's not one that we're going to disprove. Only experimental error would make your outcome not match the prediction. So what we're going to do, actually, I, I copied the whole thing here. But we are going to have our low friction track. Okay, let's draw careful pictures. That means with straight lines. So we're going to have our low friction track. And on that track, we're going to have a cart. that's on wheels I mean if this is not good quality I don't know what is so we have this cart and we're going to mount a pulley out here and then have string that goes from the cart to the pulley and then from the pulley hangs down, and we're finally going to have some a little baggie with mass in it. And so we're going to be pulling the cart with that mass. Now, if we're going to use Newton's second law, we probably are going to want to apply it to this situation if that's the situation we're testing by, right? It makes rather logical sense. So we start by saying, what forces, well, even simpler, what is my system? We need to define the system, because Newton's second law applies to a system. So anyone want to take a shot at to what system we're going to analyze? Nope. There's options. Nope. Okay. Good. What'd you say? Well, mass is an important property of our system, but we have to define what the system is before we can define what the mass is. Our system is going to be everything that is moving in this picture except for the pulley. So our system is going to be The car, oh, I didn't mean to do that. The cart and the string and the baggie. All that stuff is moving. And of course, the, ba the little washers that are in the baggie. So all of that's our system. Now, when you apply Newton's second law, you're looking at the sum of the forces on the system. So I'm not going to look at external for, or excuse me, to forces within the system. I'm looking at things acting on the system. So now I'm going to ask you specific questions to identify what things, what forces are acting on the system. And I will start with the, the back right corner and work my way in a ziggy zaggy fashion. So Denford, what's something that's acting on the system? Gravity. Okay, force of gravity. There's gravity acting. I'm going to divide it up into two pieces. One piece will be the force of gravity on the cart, and the other piece will be 
the force of gravity. I'm going to put H for hanging, okay? It's hanging off the end. So gravity. Okay, Andrew, next one. What forces are acting on my system, which I defined here? Okay, there is tension, but it's internal. It's not acting on the system. It's acting within the system. And I'm only looking for the things acting on the system. Friction. Okay, friction. What kind of friction? Uh, it turns out, that's a bad question for me to ask, it's the rolling kind, the kind we didn't talk about, right? Okay. There's also some air resistance, which we also didn't talk about for the most part. So we're going to have rolling friction, but like kinetic friction, rolling friction is opposing the motion. So the rolling friction is going to cause a little force of friction like this. That says F F R I C. That's a little better. Okay, so I have the force of gravity, force of friction. What else do I have, Joseph? Okay, I've got the force normal. Now, there is one more force that's going to be a little harder to identify. Let's see if Zach can come up with it. If not, no hard feelings. Okay, the final one is the force that the pulley is putting on that string. Right, that one you probably wouldn't have come up with. That's why I said no hard feelings if you don't get it. It's not as obvious. So those are all the forces. Now I want to focus on just the direction there's motion. Remember, just like with trajectories, we can use Newton's second law in perpendicular directions independently. So I'm going to only use Newton's second law in the direction that there's motion. So what direction is the cart moving? Okay, to the right, horizontally. What direction is that baggy moving? Vertically. And now you say, wait, but I have motion in both directions. Well, that force of the pulley does only one thing. It doesn't speed up or slow down the cart. It simply changes the direction of the force of tension. And since the force of tension is the same everywhere, I can take my system and say, okay, this force of the pulley the only effect it has is to make this force here look like it's going horizontally. Question? Is that assuming a perfect pulley? Or of course, of course. Okay. Ideal pulley all the way, my friend. Just we don't go with anything not ideal here. So I'm going to redraw the system, and now it won't be as neat and tidy. I'm going to redraw the system with my cart. and my baggie out there. Instead of hanging down, it's off to the right. I've just taken the action of the pulley and said that's the same as straightening it out. So I now have the force of gravity from the hanging mass pointing to the right. I have the force of friction pointing to the left. And the other two forces, the force normal and the force of gravity on the cart, those are vertical, and I'm only caring about the horizontal now. So this picture is focusing on the horizontal. It's not complete. Now, in case you lost track of what we're doing, why did I make this diagram? To simplify it for what purpose, though? Yes. I wanted to apply Newton's second law to this. And in order to apply Newton's second law, I need to know what forces are acting on it. Now, this is a version of a free body diagram. The difference in this version and the one you had before is that this shows some object instead of just a dot for the system. But otherwise, it's the same idea. So now I'm going to take 
This direction is my positive direction. Positive, I'll call it x direction. Sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. That's Newton's second law. That's the part that I'm going to be testing. So this is going to give me a relationship, and I'm going to test to see if the relationship holds. So if I look at my picture, what do I have for some of the forces? We drew the picture because it tells us the answer to that question. Almost. The force of gravity is the same direction as my plus x, so that's positive. But the force of friction is the opposite direction, so that one's a negative. So it's going to be the force of gravity hanging minus the force of friction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Now, for my actual problem, I am going to adjust the force of gravity hanging. And so I, let me solve this for force of gravity hanging. And so there's the equation I should have to relate the acceleration and the force of gravity hanging. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a graph. <laughs> Let me look at this and make sure one last time what the graph is. Actually, what am I doing? I've got it on the computer screen right here. We're going to make a graph that has this force of gravity hanging on the vertical axis and has acceleration on the horizontal axis. So this here is going to be the y variable on the, on the graph, and this is the x variable on the graph. Now, how many people have made graphs, linear graphs, like me, outside of this class? Okay, so we got a few. Do you know what the equation for a straight line on a linear graph is? Okay. For a straight line, you should have y equals mx plus b. What a convenient coincidence that <laughs> that the thing that x is multiplied by is m in both equations. What is M, what does that stand for? The slope. And what is B? The y-intercept. So now we can look at this and say Newton's second law tells us that when we make this graph with the force of gravity hanging on the vertical axis and the acceleration on the horizontal axis, it should have the same equation as a straight line. So I should have a straight line relationship. That's a prediction of Newton's second law. And then it makes a second prediction. It actually makes a third one, but the second prediction is the slope of your line should equal the mass of your system. So that's another thing we can check. If the slope of our line is the same as the mass of our system, that's a really good match. To Newton's second law. Now the third prediction this makes is it tells me that the force of friction I can find for the y-intercept. Uh, we don't know what the force of friction is, so that's not going to be a good check for us. But we have those other two things. Now keeping in mind that the goal of today's experiment is for you to, to test and verify Newton's second law, in your conclusions you definitely should have statements about if you had a straight line relationship and why that was important, and if the slope equaled the mass of the system and why that's important. Now, talking about this, um, Twissa was saying, and it's as close as I can come to saying his name, it's so hard not to end with a constant sound for me. He told me that when people are answering questions where it tells you to explain, there's not much explanation. And we don't want students to lose points there. 
So we will, you know, want to make sure you know. We're looking for you to actually explain, show thinking, and not just, you know, well, because it felt like. Right? Have some reasons for things. Um, also, um, we noticed at the beginning of lab that the acceleration at the very peak of the motion when the car was going up and down the graph, that was graded wrong. The acceleration should be down the entire time. While it's going up, the acceleration was down. When it was at the instant it was at the top, its velocity was zero, but the acceleration was down. And the acceleration was down, coming back down. So he's going to have to go through and change your grades on that, just to let you know. So people don't freak out either having it wrong and not graded incorrectly now, or having it right now and saying, wait, it was right. OK. Getting back then to the experiment, we have this equation we're going to try to verify. So all we need to do is do experiments measuring how much acceleration we get with different masses. So for the experiment, actually, I'm going to come back up to my pretty picture on the preceding page. It was pretty good picture, I felt. One of the things that I'm going to have to do to make my, here you see that same equation written out in the first form. In order to make my straight line come true, I need to have a constant mass. If I'm changing the mass from trial to trial, then I don't have a constant slope, right? Because m was the slope and m was the mass. So we need to keep the mass in our experiments constant. To that end, we are going to start by putting eight washers, uh, change the color here, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're going to put eight washers in the cart and put two washers in the baggie. Total of ten washers. And then we're going to let the cart go and measure the acceleration. Then we want to keep the mass of the system constant but change how much mass is in the baggie. So we take two washers out of, the out of the cart and put those in the baggie. So now we have four washers in the baggie and we repeat. We've doubled the force that's being used to accelerate it. We should get double the acceleration according to Newton's second law. And you're going to keep going, take two more out of the cart, put two more in the baggie until you have all ten of them in the baggie. And measure the acceleration. So your entire data is five experiments. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six, eight. Yep, five. So now I haven't gotten to the nuts and bolts of it, but just to the what we're going to do. Here is the actual nuts and bolts of the experiment. The first thing you need to do is level the track. Remember how we leveled the track last week? Do it again. Also, you need to answer here, what difference will it make if the track isn't level? It will make a difference, an important difference in our results. So you need to think about what difference it will make if the track is not level. Then you have to sketch qualitatively, that means just the relative shapes of what the position, velocity, and acceleration graphs will look like before you do any experiments and you have to explain how you came up with those shapes. Don't say, well, because it felt right. Give a reason why you have those shapes. Now, where are you going to make those graphs? Whoops. No, that's, I was on the right page before. No, this is it. Now, mine says motion with two and ten washers in bag. <laughs> Yours only says motion with two washers in bag because I forgot a couple words. So on this, you're going to draw what you think it will look like. Now, you need to draw for 2 and for 10. Now, in my case, let me make these blatantly wrong, okay? So these are not the correct results. But I would say, okay, this is what my two washers looks like. And this is what my tin washers looks like. Something so I can compare the two. 
Now, like I said, those are blatantly wrong, not even close to correct. The reason I'm not making them close to correct is because I want you to think about this before you do them, not just say, well, here's what he drew, so let's do that. So you need to do the position as a function of time, the velocity as a function of time, and the acceleration as a function of time. So you're drawing your predictions. Why are you drawing the predictions? Well, to see how well you understand motion before we start. And then we're going to see if you do it right. So after you have made your shapes and explained why, then you're going to start with two washers in the bag and eight in the car, just like I said, and measure the acceleration. Now, how do you measure the acceleration? This one here is really <coughs> among the easiest you can come up with. So now I don't have anything connected here, but I can open up the Newton's Second Law lab. And I don't need that. I don't have stuff here because it's not connected. When you're ready to start, one person sits here with the mouse and says, you ready? The other person says, yeah, I'm ready. And then they hit start, and they say, OK, release it. There's no rush. It won't start collecting data until it actually starts to move anyway. So once it starts to move, you'll have data showing on this graph. And don't let the cart hit the smart pulley at the end. The smart pulley is called a smart pulley because you have a pulley, well done. And you also have a photo gate. That is, on one side, you have a little light emitter. On the other side, a little light detector. And this has, I think it's 10, um, I haven't counted it, but I think it's 10 solid and 10 open um, spokes. And so each time it goes from open to solid and solid to open, it's 1 20th of a rotation. It just marks the time for each one of those. And so that's how it's measuring your position as a function of time by how many, how much of a rotation this is made and knowing what the radius is. And then it takes that and calculates from the change from the time between one edge to the next, it calculates the average velocity and the average acceleration. Now, with your setup, things to keep in mind. You want to make sure the track is level. You had a question about that. You want to make sure that this wire is not touching any moving parts. You want to keep this as low as possible to try to make the string horizontal. You'll need to take the string, run the string over the pulley, tie one end into this little hole here. I have been stupid. I have put the string in the big hole and then tried to get it into the littler hole up here. It's much smarter to put the string into the little hole on top and let it come out the big hole. Much easier. So tie the string onto here. And on the other side of the string, you need to put a baggie. So the baggies are, by the way, here's the string. How long do you need? Oh, a little less than two meters will do it. How do you cut your string? You get that string the length you want. You say, yeah, it looks about right. You go like this. It's the cheapest, cheesy string known to man. And then you want to take the ones, okay, take it, put it through the pulley, and the one side you tie up on there, and the other side, you just grab yourself a little sandwich bag. I know it's sandwich, but I like to say sandwich. And you tie it off on this. You might wonder, how does he tie it off on that? Well, there's lots of things you can do, but here's my favorite thing. I take her pencil and I go like that. I punch a hole through it. And then I put my string through that hole and tie it. Is that tricky that was? Super tricky. So then this is the bag that's going to move up and down. When you start your experiment, you want the bag up here so it's not touching anything, but as high as you can get without touching anything. As soon as the baggie hits the ground, your experiment's over. Because you're no longer pulling with the mass hanging from this. 
So that's the fiscal setup. On your data here, you will have the three graphs that you predicted. Well, you need to answer the question of, did the actual graphs look like your predictions? What was the same? What was different? For each difference, explain why. So when you made your graphs and made your predictions, you may have been incorrect, right? You don't have perfect knowledge of physics. But after seeing the actual shape, now you need to identify what was different between your prediction and what, what was the reason you were wrong. Right? The goal here is to learn, to make sure that you understand what you thought incorrectly. You want to get out the computers. We need, oh, you already have them. Oh, okay. I just didn't see them. At least one of us is on the ball, right? That's what really matters. Okay. Recording your data. Make sure you have an uncertainty on the acceleration. You're putting the acceleration for each trial and have an uncertainty. Now, it's kind of hard to do this without having anything connected. But when you make your data, you're going to get data that's, you know, like this. And you need to select a representative piece of the data. I'm actually, oh, the only way I can connect to this is to disconnect my tablet's ability to broadcast. I will wait till the very end and then disconnect the tablet and show you how to actually find the average acceleration and the uncertainty. Because all the information will be there, but you need to know how to find it. So I'll show you how to do that later, but make sure you have an uncertainty for that acceleration. Don't just write down the acceleration values. Then you have the analysis. And the analysis is, I tried to make it as straightforward as possible. What are the two things that will confirm Newton's second law? No? Two things. I said they're important. You need to make sure you have these covered in your conclusions. Okay, the second one is the slope should be the mass. That, that one we can't test because we don't know what the friction is. The first one was, the first one's required for the, for the slope to be the mass. It needs to be a straight line relationship. So you are going to, using the spreadsheet that's provided, the same spreadsheet I think that you used a week or two ago, you go to the second tab here that says Lab 4, Newton's Second Law. Put in the acceleration for 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Well, okay, only up to 10. And so I am going to put in bogus numbers. Always bogus with me. I'll at least use something different than what I used when I did it with a twissant. So here I have my data. Now, if you look at that data... The straight line is always going to be straight because it's a straight line fit. But the first question to ask yourself is, is that data actually well fit by a straight line? Yeah. In this case, it's kind of close, but one data point appears fairly off. When you look at yours, you need to use that same critical eye. If you have a point that's fairly off, go back and do it again right, to figure out what went wrong. Because it, like I said, while you technically are testing Newton's second law, it's been tested so many times, we know what the outcome is on this experiment. So you're going to look at that, verify that it has a straight line. If it doesn't, figure out where you made your mistake. Then number two is notice it gives you the slope and y-intercept. See that in the box? So you take those two numbers and you copy them into your lab guide where it says slope and y-intercept. So you copy those, <laughs> where did I put it, <laughs> I put my stylus somewhere and don't know where that somewhere is, there it is. So you copy that slope and y-intercept into this right here. 
Now notice I labeled this. So the slope has label A, the y-intercept has label B for further use. Now we're going to go through and do some analysis. The first thing we need to do is determine what the actual mass of a washer was. From our graph, we have the mass of the system, but our units of mass were actually how many washer masses? The mass of one washer, mass of two washers. You know, your slope is somewhere like, I don't know, I don't know, 20 washer, it's got to be way the heck more than 20. 200 washer masses, I don't remember what the number is. But your answer is in washer masses. You can absolutely confirm Newton's second law without knowing the units of mass other than washer masses. But we want to measure the mass in our standard units, so we need to measure masses. So that brings us into the triple beam balance. Call the triple beam balance because it has three beams. And it's a balance. It balances when you measure something's mass. So when I measure the mass, before I do anything else, the first thing you must do is make sure that it's zero. Now, see these things have little divots that they fit into and kind of lock in place? Get it on the zero one. Get this one on the zero one. This one doesn't have those. Make sure it's on zero. And then you want to see if it actually points to zero. It has over here a little white line, an indicator line as we call it. And then it has a mark that says zero. And so you come over here and you say, is that point to zero? You're close enough, Daisy. Is that point to zero? It's pointing below zero by about two millimeters. Okay, yeah. Well, if I was there, I wouldn't either, but I figure you're young, you have better eyes. So it's pointing too low. Well, that means I need to adjust it. I'm not going to get the right value if it's not calibrated right. There is a little screw right here. And so because that's too low, I need to make that screw out farther so it'll pull it up. So I screw this out. And of course, I just do some random amount, I don't know how much, and see if I improve things. So now I've adjusted it. And now it's just slightly too high. Much, much closer, but slightly too high. So I screw it in just a small amount. Now, I did not get it perfect. I didn't even check it after that last one. So it's not perfectly zero. My measurement won't be right. But your measurement, you should make sure it's zero so yours is right. There are four of these around the room, so obviously you don't have to wait for somebody else. You <laughs> just grab one and go. Now I'm going to put something to measure the mass here. Start with the heaviest mass and bring it out. Yeah, more than that. More. Nope, less than that. So since bringing out the 200, it went down. I bring it back to 100 because I know it's between 100 and 200. Then I take the intermediate one, bring it out. Okay, that's a, a really good sign because that's the same value. That's still 200. It's less than 200. Should have been less than 200 on both measurements. Bring it back. Make sure it's in the little divot so it stays there. So now I have 190 with those two. And then I have this small slider that I bring out and adjust until the indicator once again points directly at zero. Now when I get the indicator so it points directly at zero, and of course it's not now, but once again, I'm not really measuring it, I'm just illustrating so I don't have to. I now read this, so I start with the top one, 100, the second one, 90, then the third one, actually that's pretty close, it's 97, and it's between 97.0 and 97.1. What do we do in that case? It's 197 point. I know it's somewhere between 197.0 and 197.1. I have to estimate one more digit. Remember, that's what we did the first lap. Well, looking at where it is now, it wouldn't be 0.5. It would be more like 197.02. And then we'd have an uncertainty of about 0 0.03 grams. So you need to have two decimal places with this measurement. If the last digit is zero, write it down because that means something. 
So if you don't have two decimal places here, Toisson is going to have to take out points. Now you're going to measure the mass of your of 10 washers. So you just stack 10 washers on here and measure the mass. You're also going to measure the mass of your system. What was the system? The cart, the baggie, the strain, and the washers. You put all of that together on here and measure that. That's the mass of the system. That's what you're going to compare the slope mass value to. You measure the mass of 10 washers, so we can convert from washers into grams. So here are the numbers that you measure directly. You measure directly these two, so both of them had better have two decimal places. If you measured the mass of 10 washers, how do you get the mass of one washer? Divide by 10. What's that going to do to the number of decimal places? Add one. So you should have three decimal places in this number. If you do not have two decimal places in the first two and three in the next one, you'll lose points because you've done something incorrect with your numbers. Now we're ready to do calculations. So the mass of the system, we said that's the slope, but we need to convert the units. And so this is going through the unit conversion. Notice it says insert A. So if you had had here slope was, well, what I did for playing around was 3.2887. So I would put that right here where it says insert A, 3.2887. And here it says it again, 3.2887. And then I go 3.2887 times 9.80. And this number here is what I get when I multiply those through. Now the rest of this is units. If you look at the units, I had washer weights divided by washer weights, so those cancel out. I had meters per second squared here divided by meters per second squared there, those cancel out. And so the units I was left with was washer masses. Well, now we have the slope in washer masses, but we want it in grams. So now we have to use the mass of one washer to convert that number, so here is the answer we just got in, ma in washer masses. And then the number we determined for one washer, notice it just says insert F, insert E. So you just go find where F and E are and put them there. Multiply it together and you get the mass of the system in grams. So that is your experimental mass of system. Now we measure directly the mass of the system, so this here is the actual mass of system. There were two things to help us confirm if Newton's second law was right. What was the first one? If the slope is straight. The first one is if it has a straight line. If it's not a straight line, then Newton's second law couldn't be right. And like I said, the fact is, we've done this experiment enough, we know that it is a straight line when you do it right. The second one was if the slope gives you the same mass as the actual mass of the system. So now we have our information for determining if that's correct. So you're going to take your experimental mass, that's G, so insert G right there. The measured one, I just went up to, that's C. Divide it by, again, the measured one times 100%, and that gives you a percent error of difference. How big do you suppose that should be? How far off do you think you should be? Yeah, not that far. Hopefully this is less than 5%. Notice there's absolute value. You don't have a minus 5% to worry about, just less than 5. Okay, finally, we're going to calculate what that force of friction was. So once again, it's just insert the numbers and do the calculation. And then you end with what you learned. Now, before I go to how we make the measurements, are there any questions on the, the experiment in general? 
in second analysis? Um, I tried to use bold every time you print, and so let me scroll up and see where. Yes, it says print the graph right there. Yeah, I don't remember. I have to check the guide myself because it's been two months since I wrote this. Who could remember that long? Okay, let me disconnect now the projector so I can, or not the projector, but my tablet so I can show you how to make the measurements. Um, Tyler, can you grab me the equipment from there, just uh, the, the box and the plugs that you have to use to power it up and connect it?